It's the true fact that uh, I read the uh, New Capital Manifesto actually being in India last winter. It just came out in January, I think I was there in March, uh, February, March. And I read it, and we've been discussing making a conference, and I think you were the igniting, sparkling uh, example that actually uh, made us uh, go into this philanthropic, hopelessly uh, commercial project. <laughs> we run it as a nonprofit, and we're so happy f uh, to see the Twitter cave. If uh, <laughs> anybody knows, Uma is uh, beyond, I think, 100,000 tweets, are, well, at least uh, getting there. A so lot. this Thanks. is the secret place of all the tweets. Uh, <laughs> nice to have you with you. you have prepared a, a, a presentation like uh, or a talk like 10-15 uh, minutes. I'll do a couple of questions and hopefully we'll have time to take uh, questions from the audience. So um, you're live. Thanks, thanks uh, Sophus for that wonderful introduction um, and, and it's fantastic to be here with, with all of you. Um, so okay, so, so what are we, what are we uh, here to talk about? We're, talk we're here to talk about rebuilding stuff and, and why does that matter. Let me ask you a couple of questions. If you were to play by the rules, the institutional rules today, how do you think your life would end up? My guess is that if one was to play by the rules today, you would end up probably something like broke, lonely, miserable, stuck in a job you didn't want, earning a living in a way that didn't make you feel fulfilled, and so I think that we face today a situation of great institutional breakdown. And, and that's something that you guys have talked about a little bit, right? But I don't think sometimes we really delve into just how deep it is. So let me ask you another question. Can you name a working institution? When I think about it, it's very difficult for me to think of an institution that actually works the way that it was supposed to. So, I think we're on the cusp of a great transformation. When we talk about great recession, great depression, all of this kind of stuff, I think we're actually on the cusp of a great depression, a massive tectonic shift in the way that we live, work, and play. And it's up to us to rebuild that stuff. So, so let, me, let me get into what I'm uh, going to talk to you guys about. In the beginning, I think that we had what, what I call functional economies. So let me just outline quickly three generations of economies. A functional economy is about subsistence, right? It's just about kind of making ends meet, having some kind of basic level of, of income that meets kind of your basic, you know, what Maslow called your kind of functional needs, your basic needs. And then maybe around the time of the Industrial Revolution, we took this quantum leap to what I would call an aspirational economy. Aspiration. Conspicuous consumption. Look at me. Look at the stuff I have. Look at my power in this great game of consumption. And that's kind of where we've been for many, many years now. And we see many nations trying to catch up and go from functional to aspirational economies. And here in the West, we seem to be now stuck at the level of aspiration. And we seem to be unable to move beyond it. At the same time, as we come to terms with the downsides and the costs and the kind of void that aspiration leaves inside and outside of us. So where are we going? I think that we're making a quantum leap to what I would call a meaningful economy. That's an economy that's really built around the idea of making a difference, having an impact, making people's lives better in real human terms. So to begin explaining my little model to you, let me ask you guys, what, what have most of us been doing for the last X years? I think it has something to do with a paradigm that I call opulence. Opulence, I'm going to sum it up for you in five words. More, bigger, faster, cheaper, now. And I think that when you think about it, opulence is what our institutions have been geared to produce. They're what the economy is optimized for. And I think that using this idea of more, bigger, faster, cheaper now, this paradigm of opulence, we can take a look back at the last century and very, you know, not perfectly, but in some sense neatly explain the history of the great innovations and institutions that changed our lives. Everything from kind of the birth of the post-war modern consumer 
it's about more, to the kind of birth of, you know, big box stores, the idea of I shop, therefore I am, which is about bigger. The idea of things like supersized meals, supersized stuff. The idea of, you know, this great global credit bubble. It's about having more, bigger, faster, cheaper, now. It's the idea of fast fashion and fast food. Even things like Groupon, things like the disintegration and reconstruction of global supply chains with the idea of offshoring and outsourcing. It was about having more stuff cheaper, faster, and getting it now. It's the idea of even this kind of wonderful app economy and this digital utopia that's been promised to us. Click a button, download it now. And so that's kind of the paradigm of opulence. And we're surrounded by this stuff. This is what we're trained to do and taught is kind of the end game of human prosperity. But at the same time, we've reached a paradox, right? We're coming to terms with some of the downsides of opulence and the limits of opulence. So China already consumes, for example, 50% of the world's cement, iron ore, and coal. But it's only achieved 10% of Western levels of opulence, at least as measured by GDP. So there's not enough stuff in the world for everybody to achieve opulence in these naive terms. It's a model of prosperity that isn't going to carry us forward into the future. And that's just the most naive way to think about it, right? Because there are also hidden costs of opulence that we don't often recognize. So we often talk about environmental damage, right? What is the cost of all of these factories buzzing away, making these wonderful, shiny consumer goods for us? How much does that environmental harm actually cost us? Well, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a groundbreaking effort to actually measure it. And the estimate of the damage was something like $2 trillion and estimated to grow to something like 30 trillion uh, over the next uh, 15 to 20 years, I believe. So, so, so we're talking real numbers. This is real harm. And, and that's only one of the hidden costs of opulence, right? Environmental harm. But we also have things like cultural dumbification, social inequality, political polarization, social fracture, financial crisis, regulatory capture, political gridlock and institutional fragility. And so all of these hidden costs and all of these downsides have resulted in what I call an opulence bubble, which is that we've overinvested in the stuff of opulence without having saved up enough to rebuild institutions that are fit for the future. And if you look at this in very simple global terms, you'll see that global consumption has been skyrocketing since about 1970. Global savings have been declining. And so, and so we're playing a game where we have got a consumption-driven global economy. But more than that, we've got a consumption-driven global economy that consumes really toxic, harmful, self-destructive stuff. And so I believe what we need to build is an investment-driven global economy that begins to reinvest in, in institutions that are capable of generating real human prosperity. So, you know, I think that we're on the cusp of, of kind of a values revolution. And, and everywhere I look, it seems to me that constituencies in society are beginning to demand not just more, bigger, faster, cheaper now, but they're beginning to demand that so whether it's people, whether as shareholders, whether as citizens, whether as employees, we're beginning to change the way that we approach uh, the idea of prosperity. And in some nations, that change is happening faster than others. And in some nations, it's happening very slowly, to be honest with you. But I think that's, that's where we're heading. So where is this change taking us? I believe this change is taking us into a eudaimonic paradigm of prosperity. So eudaimony, the ancient Greek word for a life meaningfully well-lived. So, so I use this word very deliberately. For the Greeks, eudaimonia wasn't uh, 
wasn't a game of opulence. It wasn't about more, bigger, faster, cheaper now. It was really about a life meaningfully well lived. It was about relationships that matter. It was about accomplishments that endure. It was about having a rich civic life. It was about having work that in some sense, not just fulfilled you, but went on to benefit society as a whole. And so it was a much richer conception of prosperity than the one we have now. And in some sense, it makes the conception of prosperity we have now look a little threadbare. And I think we're, the pendulum is swinging back. I think that we're beginning to take a step back and realize that prosperity in the 21st century, for many of the reasons I've discussed, is going to have to be more eudaimonic than opulent. So I think we're going to make a quantum leap from more, bigger, faster, cheaper now to, let me sum up eudaimonia for you in, in five words, my five words, not only five words, just mine. Eudaimonia is going to look something like fitter, smarter, tougher, closer, wiser. It's really about human outcomes, helping people to do and live in wholer ways, helping them to attain higher levels of human welfare, and helping them to transcend their very own, uh, very real, fragile, their, their fragilities and, and limitations. So I think we're making a quantum leap from opulence to eudaimonia. We're on the cusp of that quantum leap. And without making that quantum leap, uh, I think that this crisis that we're in is going to go on and on and on. I don't think that there's any other way out now than for us to build eudaimonic institutions. So how do we do that? What is my agenda for building eudaimonic institutions? It's not the only one, huh? but just my agenda for building eudaimonic institutions. Well, the first leg of my agenda is that we reimagine the idea of wealth. Right now, wealth is thought to be money. That's how we measure it. But we also know that real wealth is composed of things like social capital, human capital, natural capital. So it's time for us to get very serious about building institutions that measure these kinds of soft, intangible, sticky wealth. Because what we know is that they're really the linchpins of productivity, right? Richard Florida, for example, has done groundbreaking work on why creative capital kind of underpins the dynamism of, of, of great cities. And so we have to get very serious about measuring this stuff. And to do that, we're going to have to rethink things like GDP which are still very much about financial capital. You know, things like GDP don't take into account what I call higher order capital. And so if we're going to rebuild our institutions, for me, one of the key places to begin is to rebuild GDP. And to make it, uh, you know, that's what optimizes the economy. And so to rebuild GDP in a way that optimizes the economy for these kinds of higher order capital, because those things are really what make life worth living. So it's kind of the first two points of my agenda, reimagine wealth and recalibrate how we optimize the economy by redefining something like GDP. The third point is to redefine mattering. You know, the, one of the fundamental problems in, in, in our economy is that we're straitjacketed by this thing called the corporation. And the work that corporations do doesn't really matter to humanity, to the future. You know, they work on very trivial things. My favorite example is last year, one of these big consumer goods companies uh, launched designer diapers. Right? Think about this for a second. Designer diapers. Why? why? It's crazy, right? It's nuts. So, so we have to redefine matter by beginning to explore other corporate forms. Because these are the things that let us mobilize human effort and human activity. And we're beginning to do that, right? The rise of things like B corporations in the States, uh, and in Europe, you know, you, you have many different names for them, but for benefit corporations, not just corporations that exist to maximize shareholder value, which then gets added back up into GDP. So it's the third point on my agenda. The fourth point is to revolutionize work. You know, the work that we do inside these corporations often feels very trivial and unfulfilling and soul destroying. Because let's face it, it is. Who wants to spend their life working on designer diapers? I don't, you guys. So if we're going to revolutionize work, I think that we have to make a quantum leap 
in terms of how corporations organize. So to go past the idea of vision, mission, and strategy, to what I call ambition, intention, and imperatives. And, and these are ways to say it's time for organizations to think bigger, to have goals that really benefit and impact humanity, that aren't just there to satisfy the latest round of shareholders, who at this point are mostly hedge fund trading robots. The fifth point on my agenda is to reboot how we engage with each other, reboot life. And that means reinventing civic institutions. Because right now, we, in the advanced world, have a real poverty of civic institutions. We don't really engage with each other at a civic level anymore. And I think this is beginning to happen. If you look at things like Occupy Wall Street and the General Assembly, if you look at the various online fora that have sprung up about reinventing democracy, if you look at the various kind of civil, uh, the various kind of civil society websites that have sprung up, something like Tweet Minister in the UK, these are ways to begin rebooting how we engage with each other as citizens, as members of a society, to recalculate how much it costs us to really impact the political uh, process. And so that's kind of my five-point agenda. Now, let me qualify that. I don't think that what I'm talking about is going to happen overnight. I don't think it's going to happen in a year or two years or three years. I think the optimistic case is that we have a lost decade. So I think it's going to take at least 10 years for us to figure out how to build these institutions. But I do think, so that's the downside, huh? I do think the upside is that if we get it right, we can build fundamentally more vibrant and prosperous societies uh, than we have had before. We can take a quantum leap from aspirational economies, which are really about affluence. Look at me, look at my power, look at all the stuff that I have, to meaningful economies which are about people living lives of significance, lives that really matter in human terms. So that's my little manifesto. Thank you for listening. I hope it made sense. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so a few questions. Can you hear me, Uma? I can. Yeah. Damn it, I thought the last decade was the uh, last decade. Now we're in for 10 more years or what? No, well, thanks a bunch. Uh, people who have been uh, reading uh, the new Capitalist Manifesto, um, you also share some hopeful examples of uh, companies around the world, also big companies. Companies also, um, well, like Walmart, you actually exemplify them as a... As a transformative business uh, trying to uh, to get into 21st century business. Could, could you share a couple of examples of, of companies that inspire you or kind of like light the, uh, the hope for also sure. maybe this decade? Sure, absolutely. So, so let's start with, with Walmart. When I wrote the manifesto, Walmart was trying to do some very radical stuff, right? They were trying to actually build this as a sustainability index and, and push it through all their suppliers. Now, it seems to me that in the last year or so, since, since the book has been published, they've kind of slacked off a little bit, right? So, so, so I think it illustrates the difficulty of really making this transition happen. And that's why I said to you, it's going to take quite a while. It's not going to happen overnight. So, so Walmart was trying to do groundbreaking things for whatever reason. We don't know. Huh? There's many reasons why maybe they pulled back a little bit. They stopped a little bit. So, that, so that's one example of kind of having the right intention but not being able to deliver on it. A company that I think is doing some, some, some interesting stuff is, is Nike. Okay, so, so Nike, the obvious uh, example is Nike Plus. Right. It's, it's a website where you can go and it will help you become a better runner. And this is fundamentally a eudaimonic idea. Right? It's not about kind of look at this giant billboard and buy these shoes for $200 because they'll make you a tennis player like Roger Federer. We all know the shoes aren't going to do that. But if you go to Nike Plus, you can get coaching, tips, partnering, scheduling, all kinds of stuff that actually helps you take on the daily tasks of running. It's kind of a groundbreaking thing, and it's done very well for them. So, so that's kind of a small piece of the puzzle. And the bigger piece of the puzzle is that Nike uh, has kind of you know, a long-run plan to uh, remanufacture shoes. So they want to employ circular production for shoes. And, and I believe the idea is something like, uh, you, you use up a pair of Nikes, you take it back to your Nike town, they take it, they remanufacture a pair of Nikes from those old Nikes. 
instead of making a new pair out of foam and rubber and plastic, which are all oil-based kind of things, right? So that's a radical plan. If they get it right, it will be a tremendous source of advantage for them because they'll get what I call economies of cycle. The more they produce these shoes in this kind of circular value cycle, the lower their cost will get. Yeah. It's totally disruptive. And that's, now, a that's a different question. Yeah, and that's the case from your book was, uh, as I remember it, uh, interface floor, now just interface. We have Nadine Goods yeah. with us here today. That was yeah. one of the companies you mentioned. What, what is so yeah. special about that? Look, Interface, uh, you know, is a radical company. Interface was founded by my like, uncle Ray Anderson, who was uh, very much a radical. And, and so Interface has been focused on some of these ideas for a very long time. For example, circular production. They've developed a technology that lets them make carpets out of all kinds of stuff, old plastic bottles, and that lets them make new carpets out of all, all, all kinds of stuff, whether it's old plastic bottle trash or, or old carpets. Um, you know, that's pretty radical stuff. They've taken some pretty big steps to, to reduce their environmental impact. Um, you know, and, and this stuff is working for them slowly. But, but I want to caution you that it's a system change. Enough companies do it by themselves. Societies have to work together to make these changes happen. Um, and, and we can talk about how. Okay. Uh, so for the last two questions, you announced quite radically or dramatically, <laughs> you, you can say, a midlife crisis in Harvard Business Review <laughs> a couple of months ago. So uh, how's it going there? You know, <laughs> it's, it's funny that you ask. So I wrote that post, and, and the post was really about life crisis. It wasn't really about a midlife crisis. And, and so I got a lot of comments back saying, well, you know, here's a way to deal with a midlife crisis and all of this kind of thing. <laughs> And I didn't really respond to the comments, but I wrote another post after that talking about the ideas of what it means to kind of look. And the life crisis idea was really born out of me spending three months in New York. And everybody around me, uh, kind of in their 30s, huh? and, and so I don't think we're kind of having midlife crises just yet, but uh, everybody around me was kind of, un, you know, really kind of unfulfilled and lost and adrift. And, and they felt like, you know, they didn't know where things were going and what to do about it. And so in the life crisis post, I really want to make the point that institutional breakdown is not an abstraction. It has real personal consequences. And the personal consequence isn't just that, you know, you don't have the job you want or, or what have you. It's that as a human, you really kind of feel lost in the world. And, and so if we're going to begin thinking about how to re, uh, reorganize and reorient our institutions. It's very important for us to, be, to, to begin with the understanding that they're there to anchor us in the human world. They're not just there to churn out stuff and money. If they don't make us feel whole or complete, then in some sense, we haven't built them properly. Um, and maybe it's something that, that you, know, you, guys, you guys feel as well, you know, this, the sensation of, of feeling adrift. And so that's what the Life Crisis Post was really about, if that makes sense. So, so people following you on Twitter uh, won't be uh, in doubt that uh, you think the politicians in Europe are not doing a, a good job uh, handling the financial crisis. So no. we got uh, Margrethe Vestager, the Danish uh, uh, Minister of Economy, and she's also chairing the EU ministers at the moment, so powerful lady here later today. <laughs> uh, a good advice now, you have the chance to be constructive. Listen, I think that I think it's funny that, that, that uh, you say that. Listen, I think Denmark is actually doing very well. Huh? We build an index of countries at the lab, and one of the countries that's consistently at the top in terms of institutions is Denmark. Now, Europe, on the other hand, has, has some real problems, right? And, and we have problems reigning in our financial institutions. I think we have problems reigning in our financial institutions because we haven't built some of the stuff that I talked about. So we don't have a measure of GDP or real wealth that allows us to go back to our financial institutions and say, listen, you guys are not doing your job. You're not lending in a way that makes society meaningfully better off. And so I think one of the challenges for Europe is pushing some of these ideas that have happened at, at a kind of country level in Europe. So for example, Denmark actually does uh, measure a little bit what I would call real wealth. Denmark measures kind of well-being, kind of eudaimonic stuff. I think a real challenge for Europe is beginning to measure those things that are Europe like. And then beginning to say, can we uh, use these to reorient our institutions? Until we can do that, uh, you know, we're going to have the same discussion, which is really just about money and banks and finance. And the real, the real question is, where does all this money and banks and finance 
here's what ends up taking us. If we want to avoid these kind of spectacular bubbles that recent recently had, we need to ensure that our institutions are not investing in pointless stuff, right? Giant high rises that nobody will ever live in. So it's back to uh, Joseph Steiglitz and his work for the uh, French uh, minister on uh, getting beyond the GDP. Okay, we're going to take some questions now from uh, the audience. Laurie is here with the microphone, and I hope uh, they get through loud and clear. Otherwise, I will uh, repeat the questions. Okay. Any questions for Uma Haig from the audience? Please don't uh, hold back. Anyone? Okay, so I'm going to pose a question. Ah, there's one. Ole. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, in the former panel, uh, there was some, at one point some discussion about, um, uh, about uh, GDP, which uh, was also just talked about now. And um, we weren't really fully fulfilled. I mean, what recommendation would you give to the Danish finance minister about uh, measuring eudynamic GDP instead? OK. I, look, I think that, so, so let's get technical for a second. GDP, so you wouldn't confuse your income with your wealth, right? If I was to say to you, George, you might say, well, I make a lot of money, but it hasn't added up to much in terms of wealth, so I'm not really that rich. Now, GDP is a measure of income. It's not a measure of wealth. It's a flow measure, not a stock measure. So what I propose in, in Betterness, my second book, is that nations begin to build balance sheets of real wealth to measure their stocks of human, social, natural, whatever, creative capital. And, and it's up to nations to decide what they want to measure. Huh? But what we're doing, in a sense, in the global economy is that we're optimizing for a measure of income. It's like optimizing for the biggest salary without ever checking, does this add up to anything in, in, your, in, your, in your life? And, and so that's my biggest recommendation. Countries. And, and when I went into my five-point agenda, maybe I, maybe I wasn't clear enough about it, but I think that's the first step that we need to take. And I think countries can take that step. I think that global institutions can take that step. You know, what is the role of the IMF or World Bank? Well, one of the reasons they exist is to compute authoritative estimates of global GDP. So they compute the world's income statements. They don't compute the world's balance sheets. And so we have no idea globally what is our level of kind of natural human, social, blah, 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 capital. And so if you want to start, if you want to go down a eudaimonic path, build a real balance sheet for your country. Get away from optimizing just purely for GDP because it's like optimizing for income over real wealth. Once you know how you're doing in terms of real wealth, then you can begin building an economy based around it. So if an economy has a balance sheet, then you can go back and say to your corporations, hey guys, you are adding to this. We need to change the way that you operate. You can go back to your banks and say, we need to develop financial instruments that are centered around the idea of eudaimonic control. So, but for me, that's really the lynch, build a real balance sheet. Thanks a lot. Have we got more questions from the audience? Yeah. Hello. Uh, I have a question to you regarding the, um, the notion of forces in a, in a society where we change the, basically the game altogether. Um, uh, in a global context, we're sitting in Copenhagen with one million people and uh, there's seven billion people on Earth, so whatever we do here doesn't really matter. Um, how do you think that will pan out the, ten, the next 10 years? Because these institutions will have to be built globally, wouldn't they? Yeah, I think they do. Listen, I think that um, what, we, what we do in the advanced world, I think it does matter. And I think it matters a lot. I think that we are already further ahead in terms of institutional kind of building than the rest of the world. And I think that there are many countries around the world who are looking to us to pioneer the next generation of institutions. Now, that's not, that's not to say that we're the only guys that can do it. So we talked a little bit about GDP just now. Guess who invented GDP? It was America, with help from the UK. These two countries created GDP. Now, guess who's already reinventing it? China and India. They are actively doing this. In fact, China last year already released an updated measure of GDP. And so we're kind of behind the institutional curve. Okay, so, so one way to see it is that there's a game of global competition happening, and that the nations with the most fit institutions are going to have the most prosperous economies. Another way to see it is that we've been at the cutting edge for a long time, and it's up to us to stay at the cutting edge, because the rest of the world isn't going to hold back. They may look to us for ways forward, 
but that doesn't mean they're going to stay behind us forever. And in some sense, they're already institutionally leapfrogging us, if that makes sense. So it's time for some uh, reverse engineering in this field also, copycatting the, uh, the Chinese people. Okay, I have a question from Lars Kolin. My name is Lars Kolin. I have a question for you. Uh, you know the 20th century's boss. What is the most important characteristics of the 21st century leader? Ah, that's a good question. Listen, I think that, um, to be very honest with you, I think we don't need more leaders. You know, I think, I think the idea of leadership is kind of an industrial age artifact. Huh? You, you have these leaders because you have giant bureaucracies that don't want to move. They're like these big ships that are very difficult to steer. And so we invoke this character of a leader. And the leader's job is to be able to fight the bureaucracy and, and steer the ship in whatever direction that he wants. I think we need the opposite of leaders. I think we need what, what Asimoglu and Robinson, these very eminent economists, call inclusive institutions. Institutions that allow people to participate more and better, that allow people to make the most of their own lives. And I think that the more that we look for leaders, in a sense, we're looking for the opposite of working institutions, if you see what I mean. Interesting. More questions from the audience? Uh, we're going to cut it off. Sorry, only one question. But we got to get on with the uh, breakout sessions uh, for now. Uma Haig, thanks a lot for being with us. You've been Thank an you. inspiration also today. So I uh, hope to catch up with you uh, sometime in London to meet uh, and maybe see the Tweet Cave. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks. Thanks, Take you guys. Care. Give a hand. Bye-bye.